Happy to see you. Great for you to be here. So happy to see each one of you. We're here for to join together with fellow believers to honor and worship and sing praises to our Lord. Let's do that today. Let's stand, please, and sing. This is amazing grace. the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King of all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King of all chaos back into order who makes the orphan the son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace week, you got to hear some wonderful kids and youth do a presentation last week. It was a great presentation. It was a wonderful message, and they did it so well. And one of the sang songs that they sang last week is the song that we're singing right now. Sing to the King. By the way, do you remember that cooler word we learned last week? Unselfy Un was the cooler word, right, about sharing of ourselves rather than thinking about ourselves so much. It's a great thing. Thanks to the children and the youth and all their workers who put that together for us and helped us to worship and taught a great lesson at the same time. Let's sing to the king. Two, three. <laughs> to the king. 
Thank you so much. Why don't you be seated for just a moment. We're so glad that you're here and would want to make sure everyone feels welcome today. And if you're visiting with us today, particularly we want to make sure that you feel welcome. And we would like to encourage you, if you would please, to take that connection card, which is in the pew rack in front of you. Or if you prefer, you could scan that little uh, QR code right there on the back, that red one, and give us a little bit of information about yourself. If you do the card, just drop it into the play a little bit later on when that gets passed. We would love to have a chance to get to know you and um, uh, welcome you to our congregation as well. We, uh, for those of you that are regular attenders, you know that that QR code you can also use for to online giving and submitting prayer requests and the like, and I encourage you to use that as works well for you. We have a scripture reading now this morning, which is taken from the book of Revelation. Uh, chapter 15. I'll read the text which is in white and invite you to join on that which is in gold. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed.
our God. We're here to worship him today. Let's continue now together as we sing goodness of God. I ask you to stand once again.
pierced my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled.
Father God, we just thank you that we could be here today. Praise your name, Lord. Just thank you for that blessing. Lord, we pray that you bless these offerings and tithes for the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Over the last 10 years, internet or viral or online challenges have become the end thing. 10 years ago, things were really launched. Some of you probably remember in 2014, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, and it was all over the internet. And really, it was charity-driven. It was a great thing because it was challenging people to give to the ALS Association and really creating awareness of that terrible disease. Now since that time, there have been internet challenges that are just silly and, and really are meaningless, and some of them, frankly, have been dangerous and target teenagers and should just be left alone. But some of the silly ones was like the cinnamon challenge, where people were challenged to video themselves uh, eating a spoonful of cinnamon and not drinking anything for 60 seconds. Well, you can imagine people videoed themselves and they were, you know, the dryness of the cinnamon and the spices, you know, and the powder going up into their noses and they're coughing and choking and some of them are getting sick. And, you know, I saw some of that online. And I'm like, why? What in the world? But people love challenges. And then there was the hashtag, huh, challenge. Anybody remember that? Oh, come on now. We got to get with it. I mean, that was where people videoed themselves calling out somebody about something and then saying, huh? I mean, it was just utterly silly. But, but, it, but I saw people in church doing that to one another. The, the point is that people love to be challenged. People step up to challenges. And the church should be a place where people are challenged. In this uh, middle sermon in this series on church should be, uh, we come to Luke chapter 13 and verses 18 through 35, and we're just going to track Jesus this day. 
He is making his way to Jerusalem. His time is coming to an end. He knows that the, the, the grains of sand and the hourglass of time when he would be on the cross, they're winding down. Uh, his period of popularity, year two, has faded. People are turning away from him. Oh, yeah, there would be an uptick on Palm Sunday, but in hours the crowd would fade. And none of those people would be there when he stood before Pilate. And the angry mob shouted, Crucify him. Too often the church is a place of comfort and complacency, but the church ought to be a place where people are challenged not to fall off the stage. <laughs> Whole other story i got to tell you about that sometime, but not today. But we see in this passage five challenges that I believe apply to you and me and to the church. Jesus challenged people. And we ought to be challenged in the church. First of all, in verses 18 through 21, the church should be a place where, where people are challenged to grow. We're just going to start slow. Verse 18. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? So we're clear on what Jesus is talking about. Absolutely clear. He's talking about the kingdom of God. What shall I compare it to? So this is a comparison that he's making. It is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree and the birds perched in its branches. Anybody here plant mustard? Oh, okay. So, so mustard seeds, I've never seen one except online, but I understand they're really pretty small seeds. But when you plant it and it germinates, and if you leave it alone, it can become a fairly large plant, even a bush, and perhaps depending on what variety, even a small tree where the birds of the air can come in. That's what Jesus was saying. And, and what he was talking about was the exponential growth from the tiny mustard seed to a bush or a small tree. The church should be a growing place. The church is not all about numbers. Certainly, it's not all about numbers. But remember last week, the church should be a place where people are committed to bringing people to Jesus Christ. And numbers at least are an evaluation of whether the church is growing. You know, the kingdom of God started that way with a small baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Thirty years later... Jesus gathered around him 12 disciples. They were very unimpressive. And then after three years, there were 120 core followers. And then Jesus died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again, proving the victory over sin, death, and hell. He ascended on high. And then the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. And Peter, in the power of the Spirit, preached in the city of Jerusalem. And 3,000 people believed and were baptized. Acts chapter 4, verse 4 says that number had grown to 5,000. And really, if you understand the book of Acts, it, it really tells about the expansion of the kingdom of God through the ministry of Peter to the Gentiles and also through the mission trips uh, of the Apostle Paul. And since that time, millions of people have given their lives to Jesus Christ. And if we believe that people are lost without Jesus Christ and that people need the Savior, then the church should be a mission, an outpost for reaching people. And certainly the church should be a growing place. And over the next few weeks, even the next few months, uh, I'm going to challenge us to be more effective in growing and in reaching people for Christ. But it's not just external growth. We should be growing internally and spiritually and be transformed as well. Look at, the, look at the passage as it continues in verse 20. And again, he asks, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? So again, be very clear because we find these terms uh, applied in different ways, some negatively in other passages, but this is clear. He's applying it in a positive way to the kingdom of God. It is compared to the kingdom of God. It looks like a yeast that a woman took and mixed in about 60 pounds of flour until it, it worked all through the dough. I'm not a baker. 
But I know that, that the yeast can work through the dough and, and it works silently. It, it works unseen. But, but it makes its way through and it brings transformation. And somebody can probably explain this to me, one of you ladies after church, and it can cause the dough to rise. You see, we have Christ in us through the Holy Spirit. And we are like little babes in Christ when we come to know Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord. But that's not where we are to stay. We are to continue to grow. Peter challenged in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We grow as we spend time in God's Word. Peter said very clearly that we are to take in the pure, the sincere milk of the Word. It's our spiritual food. And Hebrews 4.12 reminds us it's living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. We have to be taking it in and through prayer, but not only personally. You know, are you plugged into a Bible study on Wednesday night or on, on Sunday morning? And, and we have to be in the Word and prayer. And the church certainly should be a place where we are helping people to grow in their faith and relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, uh, after talking about all the mercies of God, it, it, he moves over to chapter 12 in the book of Romans, and Paul says, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the only way that can happen in this corrupt world is through the Word of God and prayer. The church absolutely should be challenged, and every individual and every person and everything we do, we should be challenged to grow. But there's more. The church should be a place where people are challenged to be saved. Now, now we want to pick it up in, in, in verse 22. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? That is the question of the ages, isn't it? That's the question... From Jesus' day, that's the question today. How many people are going to go to heaven? Who's going to go to heaven? Just a few years ago, Barna Research Group uh, did a survey, and 44% of the people, I bet it's more now, um, said that after a, a person dies, regardless of their religion or faith, everybody goes to the same place. Really? There, there is a, a predominant teaching today and a belief among, I'm not going to call names, I could, but I just don't have time to get, to get into all that, but there are some major people that you would know that, that really fall into what we call theologically syncretism, and that is that just all roads ultimately lead to the same God. If you just believe in your faith sincerely, Whatever you believe, as long as you believe sincerely, that everybody's going to end up in the same place. But, but what did Jesus teach? How did he answer that question? He said to them, make every effort to enter through, what's the phrase? Narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able isn't that amazing? People say Christianity is narrow. They teach there's only one way to be saved, only one way to go to heaven, and that's through Jesus. Yeah, it's narrow. Jesus Christ said it's narrow. Jesus said, and John quotes him in chapter 14 and verse 6, he said, I, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I'm it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Jesus came to save. Do you know John 3, 17? Where it says that God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Amen and amen. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. He is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. And He offers the free gift of salvation to everyone who believes. Whoever believes, whoever believes, verse 18, whoever believes in Him is not condemned. 
Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said, and you will be saved. Jesus said a number of things about salvation in this passage. He said, I'm the way. He said, the way is narrow. But, but notice also, Jesus said that once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. You see, the time will come when the opportunity for people to give their lives to Jesus Christ will be closed. You remember the, jo uh, the story of uh, Noah and the ark? And Peter tells us, gives us a commentary on that. And he says that Peter was a preacher of righteousness. And while he was building the ark, Noah just pleaded with people to repent of their sins and believe in God. But they refused. And the day came when God led the animals two by two into the ark. And then Noah's family went into the ark. And then Noah went into the ark. And the finger of God shut the door of the ark. And the heavens opened and the rain began to pour down. And the flood waters began to rise. And I have no doubt when the water was knee deep and when it began to rise and people's homes began to flood, there were probably people banging on the door of the ark wanting to get in. But the door had been closed. The opportunity was gone. When a person dies apart from Jesus Christ, it's too late. When Jesus Christ comes again, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that He is Lord. Those of us who know Him will do it in, in humility and glory and splendor and surrender and worship. Those who don't know Him will do it, but they will do it kicking and screaming, but they will bow before the King of kings and Lord of lords. The opportunity is narrowing. We never know. Today is the day of salvation. Notice also, Jesus teaches something else about the nature of salvation. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and taught in your streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be those who think they are saved. They go to church. They practice religion. They practice religious rituals. And they think because of their religion, because of their rituals, or because they're a good person, they think they're saved. And the day will come when they die or when Jesus comes again, and they're going to say, Lord, we did all these things in your name. And, but the fact is, they never repented of their sins and put their faith personally in Him as Savior and Lord. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. It is a warning. That, that, that Jesus is the Son of God and we know Him personally. We have to have a personal faith in Him. Religion, works, religious rituals will not, will not save a person. You have to know Him personally when you repent of your sins and give your life to Him. There are also consequences, Jesus teaches, for not believing in Him. You know, we have laws in our country today, and uh, if I'm going 100 miles an hour down 59 trying to get here by 1030 on Sunday morning, I've not done that yet, by the way, um, and a highway patrolman pulls me over, I'm going to get a ticket. And if I say, no, you, you don't understand, I'm the interim pastor at First Baptist Church, and the service starts at 1030, and I was running a little late, and I really have to be there because it starts at 10.30, so you really need to let me go. You think he's going to care? Nope. Absolutely, totally not. Tom, you're right. I'm going to get a ticket because I broke the law, and there are consequences. Our God is a holy God. He's perfect. He's pure. The Bible says He is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. But He will judge sin because... He is also a righteous God and a just God. And while He offers salvation to everyone, ultimately sin will be judged. You see, John 3, the second part of verse 18, says those who believe in Him are not condemned, but those who do not believe in Him are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. 
Jesus paid the penalty of the law, the death penalty. He paid the ticket on the cross for you and for me. And the only way to escape the consequences of being on spiritual death row is to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Now, now listen, follow the rest of this passage. Jesus says in verse 28, there will be weeping there. Where's there? It's hell. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are thrown out. You remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? Lazarus was the beggar. He was poor and had sores, and the rich man had everything, treated Lazarus horribly, and they both died, and Lazarus went to heaven, and the rich man in hell looked up. We learned so much about hell from that passage. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of torment. It's a place of fire. It's a place where you never die. It is a place, I think there's physical pain there. Yes, the Bible teaches that, but I think the greatest pain is emotional and mental and spiritual regret for having thumbed your nose in the face of Jesus Christ. There will be consequences. People say, well, I just can't believe a God of love would send people to hell. Well, a God of love doesn't send people to hell. People choose to go to hell when they reject the love and grace and the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's a choice that people absolutely and totally make. So the church should be a place where people are challenged to grow and the church should be a place where people are challenged to be saved. We have to tell the truth. We don't have to be ugly, never arrogant. But, but in the church, we have to tell the truth that there's only one way, and that's through Jesus. You have to A, admit, B, believe, and C, confess your faith in Him. It's on the order of, of worship there. And there are people in your life and my life who don't know Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord, and we have to tell them. We don't have to be ugly. We can find ways to do that. Oh, gosh, man, so many ways of communication today, text messages, email, um, you know, you can call anybody. We've got a cell phone. Now, it's just amazing, right? We're without excuse. With grace and love and gentleness, humility and transparency, we can share, you know, you know what? I just know that I have the grace and love and joy of Jesus in my heart. I'm not perfect, but I want you to have that. And here's how you can have that. You don't have to be condemning. Never be better than thou. But we have to tell people that Jesus loves them. He cares for them. He died for them. He rose again. And that through faith in him, they can have everlasting life. Church, thirdly, should be challenged to be inclusive. Verse 29. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take place, uh, their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last will be first and first will be last. You see, people from the far east and people from the far west and people from the south and people from the north that represents all kinds of people will be in heaven. Revelation 7-9 says that there was a great multitude that John saw in the Revelation in heaven, and there were people from every tribe, every nation, every people, every language. We will not lose our racial distinctions in heaven. And the church should look like heaven. But you see, it's not just about being inclusive racially. It's about being inclusive of people who are different from us. It shouldn't matter whether you drive a, a Lexus or, you know, a 1965 Ford pickup. Um, it, it shouldn't matter whether you wear a suit and tie or whether you wear a t-shirt and blue jeans. It shouldn't matter your education level. It shouldn't matter. We are to be inclusive in the church. Let me break it down to the nitty gritty of what I've seen as a pastor over the years. Visitor comes. They're in your Sunday school. Oh, you greet them, you welcome them, 
you ask their names, you introduce yourself, and they're not even realizing it because you've known the rest of the people in there all your life. And so there are inside jokes and inside conversations, and maybe you even start talking about where you're going to go to lunch afterwards right in the earshot of those who are you just welcome as guests. Why not be inclusive of them and have a conversation that can include them? It has to be intentional. And in, invite them to lunch. Be inclusive. See, we can be exclusive and not even realize it in the church. And I've just seen it in every church I've ever been in. It's not intentional. It's not mean spirit. But we have to be aware and we have to be very prayerful and intentional about being inclusive of other people. And especially people who are new and especially people who are different from us. People have a hard time when they come to church. And even when they join a church, they may not know everybody. And they need someone to include them so that they can have friends and fellowship as well. I just believe the church should be a place where believers are inclusive of everyone. We just have to work at it. It's an awareness. It's a prayerful thing as well. And then the church should be a place where people are challenged to press on. I just love the words of, uh, of Jesus here as we come on down to verse uh, 31. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place! Go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. As if they really cared. They were plotting to kill him at that very time. They just wanted to get rid of him. Ah, how did Jesus respond? He replied, go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. Yeah, the resurrection. In any case, I must, what's the words, church? Press on today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Understand that the period, the season of popularity was gone. People were leaving Jesus. The religious leaders were after him. They were slandering. They were lying about him. They were plotting behind the scenes. They were undermining his ministry. I think the disciples were seeing all this going on and they were wondering, you know, what's the outcome of all this going to be? Jesus knew the Father's plan. Jesus knew the Father's will. He knew why he came. And Jesus said, regardless of political pressure, regardless of death threats, regardless of people falling away from me, regardless of of people betraying me, regardless of being heartbroken and disappointed and, and being uh, lied about. I must press on because the Father has a plan and I want to fulfill His plan to the nth degree. And I just think there's a lesson for you and me today that in Christ, despite the obstacles, the difficulties, the challenges, the heartbreaks of life. We must press on. I had an acquaintance that did a revival for me a couple times over the years, and he had a sermon, and he had this phrase in it, and he applied it to different areas, and he said in, the, in a different passage, different sermon, but he applied this phrase to every point that we must press on regardless. You know, regardless of trials, regardless of heartbreak, regardless uh, of when we serve Christ and it seems to be fruitless, we have to press on regardless. That's what Jesus was saying. The Father has this, I have to press on regardless. Sometimes we get this idea that if you just love Jesus, that everything's just going to be hunky-dory, and if it's not hunky-dory, something's wrong. It's like, you know... God, why did you do this to me? Why did you allow this to happen? You know, there are questions in my life that I don't know the answers to. God's not obligated to answer Howard's questions. He never answered Job's questions. 
Levon and I, like some of you, have known heartbreak in our lives. We've known tragic deaths, and we've known friends that have betrayed us in ministry. We, it's not different from you. We're, we're not different from you. We, we've known heartbreak and trial and challenges and disappointments and had wrecks and, you know, all that kind of stuff, um, everything that goes on in life. We're not in any way immune from, uh, you know, natural disasters, illnesses, cancer. Um, we're, we're not. But we're insulated through the power of the Holy Spirit and the promises of the Word of God. We have something that other people don't have. Hebrews 10.36 tells us clearly that that we need to persevere so that we've, when we've done the will of God, we will receive what He has promised. Jesus talks about persevering under persecution. I really never thought in my life that, that I would or the church would really be under any kind of persecution. But when I see things going on in our world today, I think it could happen, couldn't it? It could happen. And will I be ready to handle it? I don't want my faith to fade or fizzle or to doubt God. I want to press on regardless. And I think that's the example that Jesus shares with us here. And we have to love one another and pray for one another and help carry one another's burdens and encourage one another in Christ. And together we have a family and a fellowship and we stand together and together we press on regardless. And we have to be challenged to press on. And then, and then fifth, the church should be a place where people are challenged to be passionate. Um, verse 34 Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. They were going to reject him after the ticker tape parade on Palm Sunday. And they would be some of those same people in the crowd saying, crucify him. We're going to be politically correct and go along with the Pharisees and the, the Sanhedrin. And he knew it. And yet he wept over them and he longed to for them to be saved and to come to Him. What are you passionate about? Uh, so I'm passionate about sports. I've been a Houston Astro fan since I was eight years old. I have, you know, I had a transistor radio way back when, and I would carry it around in my pocket even as a kid playing in the neighborhood, and I'd check in on the Astros when they were playing. They were losing all the time then. It's okay. You know, I had... You know, you know, my my dad's in heaven now, so it's okay. But I hid my transistor radio under my pillow, so when he'd peek in on me, he wouldn't know I was listening to the Astros when I should have been asleep. And yesterday, when they blew a two-run lead in the ninth inning, I was like, "Oh my goodness, here we go again! How many times this year?" What are you passionate about? A hobby, sports, your job. I've seen sometimes people be passionate in the church over their thing. So I'm going to do my thing, and I'm passionate about it, and I don't really care what anybody else thinks. It's a misdirected passion, regardless of its effectiveness, regardless of its fruitfulness. I'm going to do this because it's my thing, and I'm passionate about it. That's not what I'm talking about. We need to be passionate about what Jesus is passionate about passionate about the kingdom of God, passionate about the church being what it should be, passionate about the word of God, 
passionate about loving people into the kingdom of God. Jesus chided the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3.16 because he said, my goodness, you folks there at Laodicea, you are lukewarm. I'd rather you be hot or cold because you're lukewarm. I just want to spit you out of my mouth. I put my coffee in the microwave straight from the pot. True story. You can ask Lavana when she's here next week. 15 seconds. Pour it in the cup. Oh, by the way, I put hot water in my mug, let it heat up. And then I put the coffee in, and then I zip it for 15 seconds. And if it gets a little bit below hot, I'm back at the microwave. I can't stand it unless it's hot. We need to be passionate about the kingdom of God growing and reaching people for the Savior. The church should be a place where people are challenged and over the next two or three months going to be challenging us as we look. I don't know what God has. I don't know how long we'll be in this facility. I don't know if we'll move. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not making any uh, predictions or anything like that, but I know this. If we're going to reach people for Christ, we need to focus on being what that looks like and not just sit here till we die. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to challenge us to be more of what we ought to be. And I love you dearly, and you know that. And Lavana loves you. We brag on you guys all the time. Let's be a people who step up to the challenges of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. You love us enough that you lay down the gauntlet in your word. You tell us the truth. You tell us the kind of people we need to be. You tell us the kind of church we need to be. You lay it on the line because you love us and care for us. God, move us to step up to the challenges of just simply what we see in the word of God and what we know that we should be in our personal lives and in our church life. And Lord, we know that we can only plant seeds, we can only pray, we can only be obedient, uh, but you have to give the results and we trust you for whatever that looks like in the future. In the name of Christ, I pray, amen. Would you stand and we're going to sing together. And if you're here this morning and you need to give your life to Christ, you're yet to do that, do it today. Come on. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. I, I can pray with you and and, you know, you just, it's just a simple thing of recognizing you're a sinner and repenting of your sins and receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord. If God's moving you to move your membership here to First Baptist Church, do it today. Do it today. We're given today. Let's take advantage of today. God will make a way. couple of brief announcements uh, today at 3 o'clock is our monthly business meeting. You don't want to miss it. They're always fun <laughs> because Howard makes them fun. So you come and you be a part of that. And then next week, we know that uh, we're going to be honoring 
our children that have been a part of music and missions. Last week, we had children that were part of the music portion. Next week, we get to honor those and see what they've been up to for those that have been uh, learning about missions, and you want to be, uh, be a part of that as well. Now let's sing our parting song. We'll be on our way. This is amazing grace. This is a thing love. Thank you would take my place. Thank you would take my cross. Give it me down your life. And I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.